Yes. These are my favorite types of forums. I really enjoy having uh, opposing views and, and having a, a nice dialogue um, on differing views, and I enjoy having a very engaged audience. Um, I'll give you a quick run through of, of the format for those of you who may not have been to a forum event before. Uh, we will tend to uh, spend about 30 to 45 minutes up here. I'll, I'll moderate a discussion on a few general topics, and then we turn it over to you uh, to engage with the speakers, um, give your thoughts, have some questions. I only ask that you respect everybody else's time. People want to ask questions or, or opine themselves, so please try to keep your remarks or questions uh, as short as possible. Uh, I'm proud to introduce our panelists tonight. I think this is going to be a great discussion. First, to my far left, um, you probably have so many people say that too. <laughs> 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 uh, Dr. Yarnbrook, uh, Yarnbrook serves as the Executive Director of the Ayn Rand Institute and the Ayn Rand Center for Individual Rights. ARS Washington DC based public policy arm. He's a prominent advocate for objectivism, the philosophy of novelist Anne Rand. Dr. Brooke is a contributing editor of the Objectivist uh, Objective Standard, contributing author to the anthology Winning the Unwinnable War, and co-author of Neoconservatism, an obituary for an idea. He's a weekly guest on Front Page, hosted by PJTV, the first center-right online television network broadcasting over the internet. And he makes frequent guest appearances on national radio and TV with Objectivism's unique perspective on current events. He's a popular speaker at universities, public forums, industry conferences, academic panels, community and professional groups. His recent talks encompass the moral foundations of capitalism and individual rights. Our next guest in the center is uh, David Callahan. David is co-founder of Demos, a public policy institute based in New York City where he now serves as senior fellow and the editor of uh, PolicyShop.net, the Demos blog. He's a regular commentator on television and radio, and his articles have appeared in numerous newspapers and magazines. In addition, he's the author of eight books, including The Cheating Culture, Why More Americans Are Doing Wrong to Get Ahead, and The Moral Senate. Callahan received his BA at Hampshire College and his PhD at Princeton University. Please join me in welcoming our guests. So, let's start with a, a softball. No. Uh, um, the forum is from, from the government and here to help. Uh, obviously, uh, the trend over the past few years, uh, government has been getting more involved in issues from healthcare to, um, to banking and, and other areas. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll let you both start with just a general philosophy statement. How do you see that trend continuing? And, uh, and why do you think it's either the right or wrong way? Yeah. Well, I hope it continues. Uh -huh. and, uh, and I think it's, it's, the right, it's the right direction. You know, just to be clear, when we think of government, it's not some kind of alien entity. Uh, government is us. Government is a, is a tool that we have to use to, to do things together that we cannot do alone. And the role I see for government, mainly, is to kind of create the, the public structures which undergird success in our society, prosperity, uh, and a, a decent standard of living. And um, so I think that a key reason that government has been doing more is because there's some big unsolved problems in our society. Health insurance, millions don't have it. Classic case of a, of a problem that the government has stepped forward to to try to address, uh, and the economic uh, collapse of recent years. You know, we, we still have uh, over 9% unemployment. In my view, that's because government has not done enough. So, um, just as a very brief uh, set of opening remarks, um, you know, just to, to under, underline the point that this is a tool that we have collectively to use. And the question is not what should government do, the question is what do we as a society want to do together? I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> no, let me, let me start by first uh, 
correcting you, Dominique, uh, it, this is not a recent phenomenon. This is the phenomenon of the last, uh, you know, 80 to 100 years. Government has systematically, no matter who's been in power, no matter which party has uh, run the White House or, or Congress, government has grown every single year since at least uh, FDR's administration, probably even going back to Teddy Roosevelt. So this is not a new phenomenon, it's an attempt to use government to solve perceived problems, uh, you know, and, and usually they're framed in terms of perceived problems with the marketplace. Um, this is a this is a, a, a tool, as David said, that's been used uh, for, for close to 100 years. But we have to remember what kind of a tool this is. Um, yes, government is necessary. I mean, we can agree on that. I'm not an anarchist. I don't believe government should disappear. I believe we should have a government, so let's get that off the table. And we should have a strong government. You know, a government that does what it does really, really well and with whatever amount of money it needs in order to do it. But it should do only one thing, and that is to defend our individual rights. In other words, to defend our freedoms. It should leave us alone. And what it should do is protect us from the crooks, the thieves, the fraudsters, the bad guys who would use force against us. Other than that, it should just leave us alone. And I would argue, and we can get into more detail with this uh, as we go along through the evening, and I'm sure we will, I would argue that all the problems that David has mentioned, or the two that he's mentioned in particular, health insurance and economic collapse, are consequence of the last 80 years of government intervention. That is, uh, it's easy to see with health insurance. Uh, it's a little bit more complex to see with economic collapse because there's more parameters going on, and you have to go, and government involvement in that area has been, has been around for so long. But once you dig in, to me, it's obvious that the problem here is not too little government, but way too much government. Um, I agree with David that this is not an issue. This is an issue of what we want. We get the government we deserve, right? Uh, you know, people blame politicians, but it's not politicians, it's us. Politicians just reflect back to us what our values are. Uh, so the real question is, what kind of society do we want to live in? And, uh, I want to live, because government is force, I think we have to be very, very careful in what we let government do, uh, because force is, is a powerful thing and a, and a bad thing when it's initiated. And I think that most of what government does today constitute initiation of force and therefore a bad thing. Let's just uh, stick on that point of force and protection. I too believe that a key role of government is to protect us. And I think that uh, there, are many def there are many different ways that government can protect us. Government can send police officers into our neighborhood to protect us against uh, street-level criminals. Or government can protect us against other kinds of dangers and harms. For example, um, it, it used to be before 1966, you could, in, cars didn't have seatbelts. And... Uh, there were very few safety standards around automobiles, and there was tremendous carnage on our highways because you know, Detroit was making these cars which were extremely dangerous. Government stepped in in 1966 and said, we need to protect consumers against being killed in an automobile accident because of unsafe, defective uh, vehicles. The result is that auto fatalities have dropped by 400% since 1966. Now, if you ask me, being saved by uh, uh, government because you're not driving a cover, you know, a death trap, or because government has forced uh, Detroit to put in, uh, 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 you know, airbags or seatbelts, is just as good as being saved by the cop from uh, a murderer in, 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 in your neighborhood. I don't, I don't see much difference there. I think there's, there's a huge difference. Uh, one is clearly a personal choice. Why shouldn't I be able to drive a car that is a danger just to me? Indeed, I might be one of those people who can't afford a car with a seatbelt. And because new cars are expensive. But if you track the prices of cars since all these uh, you know, safety features have been introduced, it is priced out of the car market, a significant percentage of the population. So what do they do? They buy used cars, used cars, uh, which are less safe in significant ways than those new cars. And 
you know, I don't know. Have you ever seen? Have you guys ever seen the movie Tucker? Mm -hmm. I recommend the movie only because now I'm assuming the movie is correct. Now, you know, which is a, a, a stretch because it is it is Hollywood. But at least according to the movie Tucker, uh, Tucker was about to introduce a car with seat belts in the 1950s and was stopped and really destroyed by the yeah. intervention of government and to a large extent by intervention of government in cahoots with the big three who didn't want competition. Um, and this is what happens when government gets into the business of dictating this is good, this is bad, this will save life, that won't save lives. Is that once they get that power over the life of business, one of the things that happen is that business now have this need to go to government and fight and argue and lobby and ultimately they succumb to being in bed with government, uh, which at least Tucker the movie portrays the big three as being, uh, and manipulating the market for their short-term benefit. <laughs> we see it short-term because the big three didn't do too well, uh, ultimately. Uh, I don't think, uh, you know, you could argue that, that uh, seatbelts uh, have saved lives. I, I, I think they save marginal lives if you consider the fact that it's very, very likely, I think a certainty, that they would have been introduced anyway. It just might have taken a little bit longer. Um, and again, I think some people were priced out of the market, so they still drove very risky automobiles. Uh, but the point is, there's a principle here. Once you violate the principle, once you let government start dictating what products are good, what products are bad, what is safe, what is not safe, then the government starts violating each of our rights. It starts using that force in clearly inappropriate ways. Uh, and, you know, we get the government that we have today, which is involved in almost every aspect of our lives and is leading us towards economic, economic cultural, and, and I think moral calamity. So, um, even if it were true that seatbelt wouldn't have been introduced without government, which I think is, is very, very dubious, not worth it, still wrong. So let's stick on the car theme because this is one of the topics I didn't want to uh, get an opinion from both of you on. I mean, that is, I did well on the industry. Um, that's one of the biggest, I'd say, areas, at least in the last few years, where we saw government intervention, right? We had uh, a, a very major part of our uh, national economy uh, under pressure, and the government stepped in in a, in a very big way. Um, I'd like each of your thoughts briefly on, did you think that was a successful bailout? Should government, is that, is that a proper role for government? And should government be choosing industries in which they uh, buffer to, to, to keep going? Well, I certainly think that it was a successful bailout. We still have an auto industry here in the United States. The workers of GM are actually gonna get bonuses this year. Without that uh, intervention, uh, we could have seen the uh, US auto industry uh, virtually disappear. Uh, and um, so in my mind, that's a major success. That money is being repaid if it hasn't all been repaid uh, already. Uh, it's an example of, you know, you don't want, you don't want government stepping in left and right uh, all the time into, into, uh, to bail out this company or that company. But when you have a major industry in the United States, an industry which has been hugely important to the, this country's uh, success economically, that's about to go under, uh, I think that that is a case where you want government to play a proactive role. And uh, again, it's, it's, it is, it, in a way, that's a form of protection as well, because you have uh, tens of thousands of workers, not only auto workers, but the subcontractors who depend uh, upon the auto industry, the businesses that also depend upon the auto industry, themselves, uh, auto workers, all at risk because of this uh, uh, financial crisis. Uh, and government stepping forward and playing a proactive role. So yes, big success. So this is the fundamental difference between this kind of protection and the kind of protection that's involved in police and, and the military and, and otherwise. And that is that this kind of protection involves using force against innocent bystanders. Whereas protect me from thieves doesn't involve using force against me. Where, where does the money come to bail out the industry? It comes from bondholders in this case. I mean, what Obama did to bondholders in the Chrysler and GM is, is, is one of the things that this economy and our legal system were paid for for generations. Because basically, he, he you know, eliminated contract law in order to get his deal done. It was one of the most devastating, horrific things 
that a president has done in terms of respect for the court system and contract law and how and, and how contracts are respected. And we will pay for that dearly because once you set a precedent like that, it's going to happen again. But but the point is that somebody was sacrificed. Somebody had to pay in order to protect X number of people. So for, for Chrysler's employees to preserve their jobs, and yeah, clearly they preserved their jobs, somebody else had to give up something. Why? Why is it their fault that Chrysler goes bust? It's not my fault. It's not the bondholder's fault. It's not the fault of a lot of other people who landed up having to pay the bill. So there's a, there's a, there's a difference here. One type of protection is about protecting rights at nobody's expense other than the bad guys. Here it's about violating some people's rights in order to good, give goodies to other people. Now let's talk about the economics of it. One of the most disastrous things that has ever been done in the American auto industry was the bailout of Chrysler in 1981, I think it was, by the Reagan administration. Uh, not only was it, dis and one of the reasons it was disastrous was because it worked in the short term. That is, the government got all its money back plus interest. So they now think, we're good at this. We can save industries. But what is the consequence of the Chrysler bail bailout? The, the consequence of the Chrysler bailout is this bailout. The consequence of the Chrysler bailout, and you saw it immediately afterwards, you saw it in the 80s, you saw it in the 90s, was the fact that mall hazard kicked in. Mall hazard means when you know your, your, uh, your downside is protected, when you know you can't go bankrupt because the government will bail you out, you don't make the effort to be as good as you can be. You don't make the effort to be world class. And that's exactly what happened to the American auto industry. GM and Chrysler, Chrysler was for a brief period a really good auto company coming out of the bailout. But then they figured, what the hell, we can cruise because if we get into trouble, we'll be bailed out. Because GM never woke up. It never is ever served to wake it up. Uh, it was, it was a, it, they engaged in disastrous policies, built lousy cars, were competed into the ground by the Japanese and, and more recently by the Koreans. And it, the auto industry fell apart. And that's why it needed this car bailout. Now, what have we taught these auto companies now? Don't worry, be happy. What have we taught the employees of these automobile companies? Don't worry, be happy. You don't have to make the best cars in the world. You don't have to be competitive long term. <coughs> Just make the same old crap you used to make. Now, granted, for a few years, they'll make better cars. But then they'll go back to making the crap. And then we'll have to bail them out a few more years from now. Instead, they should have gone into bankruptcy properly. They should have been broken up. People should have had to pay for the mistakes that they've made for years and decades, including the workers, including management, including shareholders should have been wiped out. They were wiped out, at least in Chrysler. Um, bondholders should have taken a hit. Everybody involved in those companies should have taken a hit according to the law, the way the law dictates that you should do it, according to the contracts that were signed. And what would have happened? What would have happened was that some of those assets would have been sold, they would have still been automobile manufacturing in the United States, it would have been a lot less than it is today, there's no question about that. But then they would have felt, okay, now we really have to compete. Now there's really gonna be a dynamic auto industry that competes against the Japanese and the Koreans and the Germans and everybody else, because there's real downside. And when the bondholders would have given their money, they would have said, here are the terms, because we wanna make sure that you guys are gonna survive because we don't want to go through bankruptcy again. Shareholders would have been really diligent with management. Instead, you're going to get the same story over again. I don't know how long it takes. It takes five years, it takes 20 years. And by the way, like the government has now received its money back. Um, GM stock has to go up, uh, you know, maybe with a decline out three times, but anywhere between two to three times for the government to get its money back. But they probably will, and they'll learn the wrong lesson. That is, that they can be good at this. David, do you have a response to that, or you want to? Well, I... I you know, this, this story about uh, the American government being responsible for Detroit making bad cars, I, I don't really think holds up. I mean, for one thing, the, the auto industries abroad, Japan and now Korea's auto industry, have benefited from major uh, state uh, involvement and support, uh, much more in many cases than the United States. So this notion that the government, the big government, is what, is what ruined Detroit, I, I think is just false. Okay, but maybe we can move on to Yeah, yeah, well, well, we'll cover a lot of topics, and I know that there's other topics out there. I want to address this next question to, to uh, Yaron Brook. Um, a major presidential candidate recently called Social Security a Ponzi scheme. And I don't, 
as someone who you know doesn't have belief that the Holy Spirit might really be there, and you know it's a personal view, but uh, you know, on the other hand, uh, I do see Social Security as a as an area where government has tried to help protect people in terms of uh, providing uh, you know, proper assistance down the road when they retire. Um, What's your views on Social Security? I know we're going to get differing answers here, but what are your views on Social Security, and do you buy into that statement that it's a Ponzi scheme? Well, I'm, I'm pretty pissed off because I called Social Security a Ponzi scheme about 10 years ago, and I know people, <laughs> I know people who called it a Ponzi scheme even before I did. Uh, so so uh, Perry you know, didn't attribute it to the, to the people who it uh, should be attributed to. Um, I think it's absolutely a Ponzi scheme. I actually think it's worse than a Ponzi scheme. Because uh, you had a choice of whether to participate in Murdoch's scheme or not. Uh, with Social Security, you have a gun pointing to your head, and you have to participate in the Ponzi scheme. You have no choice. Try not paying your payroll taxes, and you'll see what happens. You go to jail. So this is a Ponzi scheme with force behind it, which makes it much worse. Now, why is it a Ponzi scheme? A Ponzi scheme has one particular characteristic, and that is that the returns that you pay, uh, that you pay people, come from their own capital that they put in, not from return on the capital, but from their own capital, plus from the money being put in by new people, right? So that's why, as long as you have lots of new people coming into the Ponzi scheme, it seems to work. This is how Bernie Madoff worked for a while, right? Because as long as he convinced more people to put money in, he paid the old investors out from the new money. And you can keep that going for a while. The problem is once the base starts shrinking, once you get fewer and fewer paying into the system, and you've got more and more investors that now want their money out, and now you can't pay them out, and that's when the Ponzi scheme collapses. That's ultimately what led to Bernie Madoff collapsing. It wasn't the SEC. It was, it was the very nature of a Ponzi scheme, which is self-destructive. And you see exactly the same thing with Social Security. What happened is Social Security seemed to work great as long as there were a lot of young workers and very few people retiring, and the retirement age was also very close to when you died, right? The retirement age when Social Security was first initiated was actually above the average life expectancy in the United States. Then it's easy, right? As long as you keep, as long as you keep getting a lot of people putting money into the system and paying, using that money to pay it out, then it works, right? But once it flips, which it's clearly flipping with the baby boomers, that is a lot more people are now out there receiving stuff than now people paying in. Plus, we now live to be 85. If you reach 65, you're likely to reach 85, and many people actually are reaching 90 or 95. There's no way for that system to continue working. There's so, no way so, for those families to continue working. Yeah, so it's, it's exactly a classical Ponzi scheme. Let, let me just ask you very quick, and, and if you just give a very quick response to this, we can get it. What's the solution then, aside from Social Security? Well, in my view, there's solution, nothing. Uh, in my view, Social Security, worse than the fact that it's a Ponzi scheme, is that it's immoral, but I can't answer that in two seconds. That's <laughs> why. Right. You'll have to come back to me. It's immoral. It shouldn't exist. It should be phased out. You can't eliminate it. But you can phase it out, and there are various methodologies by which you can phase it out. Chile is a good example where they privatized it, but there are lots of different ways in which you can do it, but the government should not be involved in a scheme, a Ponzi scheme, uh, to try to guarantee anything uh, for people of old age. People should be responsible. For so, so let me ask you, David, I mean, he says it's more people paying in, not going to get out in return. Maybe there's an answer to that? Is it raise yeah. the limits? or What, what do you think of well, let, let's come to the finances in a second, but just on the sort of broad principle here, what, what Social Security is, is not a Ponzi scheme, it's a social insurance program, which is basically one of the great inventions of, of modern government, which is that we as citizens collectively all kick in to uh, insure against destitution in old age. Some of us need that insurance more than others. Social Security also has a has a, a disability and survivor's benefit part. So if you're, uh, um, you know, if you lose a, lose a spouse, uh, you lose a parent, uh, you can get a payment. If you're disabled, you can get a payment. It's, a, it's an insurance system. And uh, uh, people at the bottom uh, often benefit more in this system, uh, sometimes not. And it's an insurance system that has worked phenomenally well. I mean, once upon a time in America, the elderly were some of the poorest people in our society. A lot of people worked until they died. 
1945, half of men over the age of 65 were in the labor force. Uh, today, it's down to 15%. Why were they all working, even as old men? They had to work. Otherwise, there would be no support for themselves. Even in 1960, when America was a hugely prosperous society, a third of all elderly lived in poverty. You remember the sort of stereotype, the elderly people living off of cat food? Well, that used to be the reality. And then what happened is uh, we beefed up the Social Security system starting in the late 60s and early 70s by making uh, payments more, bet, uh, more generous, by pegging them to, to cost of living uh, and inflation. And we created a system that actually protects elderly against uh, poverty, which is one of the greatest fears people have in life. You know, the notion that you're going to be an old person with no resources whatsoever, totally uh, vulnerable. Well, thanks to Social Security and Medicare, which we can talk about, that is less of a risk. Today, under 10% of elderly people live in poverty. Still too many, because those benefits still aren't generous enough. Now, as to the question of Social Security's long-term finances, this is not where the big fiscal challenge uh, for the United States lies. It's, it's more in the healthcare system. Most Social Security experts, the people who've been the commissioners in the system, uh, of the system, uh, suggest that Social Security can be made solid over the next 75 years through a series of kind of nips and tucks, a combination of, of pretty small changes. Trim benefits for more affluent uh, uh, more, more affluent recipients, slow down the cost of living, change the, the formula by which cost of living increases are made, uh, raise the, the, the cap on payroll taxes. The payroll tax is supposed to cover 90% of wages. It's, it's fallen behind. Uh, and some other sort of small incremental steps like that can be taken to make this system solid for the next 75 years and protect people against poverty. This is government at its absolute best, when we as a society come together to solve a problem that had bedeviled civilization, you know, for millennia. Um, <laughs> okay, wait, put the bottle if you want. Well, let me just say, first I, I agree about the finances. Social security is not the problem. Social security can be fixed fairly easily with the kind of combination of stuff that David mentioned. I, I would also increase the retirement age. I think that's probably part of that package you didn't mention. Uh, Social Security is not a financial problem. It can be sold. Uh, you know, that, Medicare and Medicaid uh, by orders of magnitude uh, larger fiscal problems for the United States. The fundamental problem with Social Security is a moral problem. It is a decadent, horrible program that actually encourages people not to save, not to think about the responsibility for themselves in old age, not to buy insurance or the proper kind of insurance. It destroys proper long-term uh, care-type insurance markets uh, where these things would be relatively cheap if we bought them young, but we don't even think about it because we're told we're going to be taken care of. Uh, it's also, uh, so it's a, it's a system that rewards, in my view, the worst kind of behavior. So it rewards irresponsibility. It rewards the person who gets a paycheck and spends it all the next day. Uh, Instead of, and it penalizes the person. It penalizes the person that gets the paycheck and saves a little bit of money for old age. Those are the people who get penalized because the return they would get if they put that money in the most conservative investment you could imagine is far exceeds the return they'll ever get on Social Security. So what it does is it rewards irresponsibility and it penalizes responsibility. Uh, we can draw pictures uh, of millennium, but uh, as far as I know, uh, at least 100 years ago, the, the life expectancy was well under 65, uh, and 200 years ago, life expectancy was below 40. Uh, so people haven't reached old age in recent time. Um, there's actually nothing wrong with men uh, working after the age of 65. I certainly hope I'm working uh, past the age of 75. Um, and some people are going to be responsible and save, and they're going to do fine when they're elderly. Other people are not going to be responsible and not going to save. And they, and, 
And they shouldn't be fraud. Just, just, to, just to be clear, I mean, yes. Social Security is a form of saving. We're paying into the, we're paying payroll tax every time we get, we get it's a, paid. It's we, a saving. We, get a, we, yeah. we are saving through Social Security. This is one of the brilliant things about it. It is compulsory saving. It is making us save because, as we know, a lot of people don't. Say it's not because they think Social Security is not is going to is going to be there to solve all their problems. You know, a lot of people don't think Social Security is going to be there. People, when they have four hundred one k's, don't put enough away because they want to live in the moment or they're not making enough money. So, Social Security is a fantastic way to force people to be responsible by by saving. And as for oh yeah, they could get more, uh, they they could get a better return from their stock from, from the stock market. Well, how many people in this room like their retirement security? Uh, dependent upon the stock market. We've had, we've had, for the record, it's a split crowd. We've, we've, had, we've had two major crashes of the stock market in the last uh, 12 years that have wiped out people's retirement security. Those people who are about to retire. I mean, the, having your money in the stock market is great unless you need that money when the stock market is down. And, 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 and that doesn't even get into the questions about fees and the cost of annuitization. Social Security, in fact, is an excellent deal. But David, that's a straw man. I never mentioned the stock market. I said it's the most conservative investment you could imagine. If people would run the numbers, you would do better with putting it in CDs in the bank every year, rolling over these CDs. You do a bit, you make, you make a buy, better living. And then buying an annuity? You, you make buying an annuity, absolutely. Uh, you, you do better buying an annuity than you would with Social Security. It's not forced, and you, the responsible one, don't land up having to subsidize those people who are too lazy or, or whatever, or too short term, or too irresponsible to put their money on on a regular basis. And it is a subsidy. I am going to get less from my so called saving account because I am subsidizing other people who are not going to save. If I want to subsidize, and if I want to help them, that should be my choice. This goes back to the point government is forced, government is forcing us to save. That is wrong. It is evil for somebody to tell you how to live your life. Your life is yours to live how you please. And if you don't say your problem, you can then come and ask me for my help. I might give it, I might not. But you cannot pull a gun and force me to provide you with resignment. Yep. Which is one, one, more, one more comment. <laughs> David, I'll, I'll give you the last word on this one, and we'll move on. Nobody's, nobody is pulling a gun. This is a choice that we... That, that, this is, this is a choice that we, together as a democratic society, have made. Social Security is a hugely popular program. It may be the most popular social program. And if you don't like paying payroll taxes, you know, I'm sorry. This is, the ch this is what happens when you live in a democracy. Individuals don't get to make all of their own choices. And this is, a, this is something that Iran is going to come back to again and again. You know, this, this notion that, there should, that, that we should all just be able to opt out of the social contract, that we shouldn't have to do certain things just because we don't want to do them. Well, that's not the way the real world works. Because well, there is no social contract. So we'll move on to another topic. But we can always come back to this in a little bit if anybody wants to follow up on that. <laughs> Um, I want to talk a little bit about an agency I know well, and I won't interject uh, my, my personal or day job into this, but the FDA is an agency where there's definitely strong views on both sides. Some people argue that the FDA is woefully underfunded and, uh, and needs to be beefed up to get uh, more involved. Uh, some people would rather see it go away. I, if you can imagine uh, who, who, has, who may have which view of here. But, um, so David, I'll, I'll let you have the first word on this one. Uh, talk about the FDA and what do you think the state of it is, and, and should it do more? Yeah, well, the FDA is is one of the oldest regulatory agencies we have. It was created in 1906. It was partly a response to the the furor uh, surrounding the publication of the book The Jungle, which famously revealed the the the, the horrible uh, truth about slaughterhouses and and how our 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 meat was made and and. Um, you know, since that time, it has has grown and, and taken on a lot of uh, new responsibilities. As we've seen the rise of of, of the pharmaceutical industry uh, and a number of other things. I mean, I think that that you know, before we had the FDA, thousands of Americans died of foodborne illnesses. This was just sort of one of the the, the basic realities of, uh, of 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 life, which is that maybe you eat something and die, right? 
And, and that is something that we now sort of take for granted that we don't have to worry about. I mean, there, you know, there's E. coli here and there, or certain kinds of outbreaks, but for the most part, when you buy something and, and you know, serve it to your children, you're not worried that they're going to die as a result. And that is a, a huge triumph of modern government, one that, one that uh, you know, we don't even reflect on so much because it's just been such a kind of basic part of our texture. We take for granted that when our doctor gives us a, a, a prescription uh, and, and, we, and we use it, that, that we're not going to die of some uh, horrible side effect that, that is not seen because those drugs have been, those drugs have been tested. And, um, you know, to be sure, there are problems with the FDA. And let me just say, in general, I think that government has problems, just like large corporations have problems, just like any large institution uh, has problems. There are problems with government. There are things that need to be streamlined. It would be great if, if it were possible to, to uh, streamline the drug approval uh, process so that people could get vital drugs more, more quickly. Uh, but that shouldn't distract us from the fact that this is a vital role. And a big problem of the FDA is that it is often, in recent years, not uh, offered the protection it, it, it needs to offer. Uh, so, I mean, we were chatting up here about the drug Vioxx that, that people will remember from a few years ago that, that Merck, uh, Merck introduced. And, uh, you know, Vioxx ended up being a very dangerous drug that killed a lot of people. A lot of people died because they took Vioxx. And it turned out that there had been some, uh, some trials that suggested that maybe Vioxx would be a deadly drug and that uh, the allegations are that Merck sort of swept that under the rug because it had the potential to be hugely profitable. That's where we need uh, a stronger FDA in those kinds of situations. Um, so as you can imagine, uh, people forget that uh, the jungle was a piece of mud rocking fiction, after all. It was not meant to be a, uh, a non-fiction book, and it's never been scientifically shown to be true. But put that aside, uh, I believe the FDA kills many, many more people than it helps. Uh, and I'd like, to, I'd like to talk about Vioxx, because I think Vioxx is a fascinating example of what I think is wrong with the FDA. So here was a drug, uh, a pain a painkiller, basically, that, that many people who had arthritis and other diseases uh, that, that involved intense pain uh, took. And it turns out that in a significant fraction, not, not a negligible fraction of people, uh, Vioxx created heart disease, and, and people had strokes and heart attacks, uh, and, and some people died of it, uh, of use of it. Um, on the other hand, Vioxx, uh, some people swore that it was the only drug that prevented their pain. And for some people, that pain was so excruciating that they would be happy to take the risk of heart disease and a heart attack in order to be able to take this drug, in order to avoid the pain that it inflicted. See, what government does, government is forced, it prevents those people from doing that. Why shouldn't a person have the option, given that information, to make a choice with his doctor? Should I take Vioxx, given all the risks, or shouldn't I take Vioxx? Why can't a woman with, uh, with breast cancer make the choice, given the knowledge that we have today about, I think it's Aviston, you know, that in, in, a, in a few cases saved women's lives, in many cases has no impact. Why should she have the choice of deciding, I want to take this drug, I know it probably won't work, but it might, I'm going to die anyway. Why shouldn't this be a decision made by individuals with a doctor, rather than a decision made by some bureaucrats about what drug we can and cannot have? Now, if you do away with the FDA, what would happen? What would be, you know, what would, what would fill the gap? Because the argument would be, well, where would we get this information, right? It's easy for you to say this because the FDA provides us with information about the risks and it, it lets us know. Well, there's a huge market for this, a huge market for this information. Private enterprises would fill the gap. There would be lots of labs that would come in, probably not lots, but a few labs that would come in and test the drugs. And they wouldn't ban drugs. What would they tell you is what is the positives? What are the negatives? What are the risks? And you, you, 
It's your life after all. It's not their life. You make the decision what to take and what not to take. And what kind of risks you're willing to take with your life for what kind of a benefit. Who, who's, 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 who should play God here? Who should be in a position to tell us what kind of risks we should take with our own lives and with our own health? That's something we as individuals should do with our positions. Well, I don't think that uh, it, we should be making life and death decisions based upon what we're told by a pharmaceutical company interested in making profits says is good for us, or for that matter, unfortunately, being told what doctors think. Because as we know, the pharmaceutical industry has fundamentally corrupted the medical profession. The pharmaceutical industry spends $20 billion at least marketing its drugs. 90% of that money is spent trying to influence the, the drugs that doctors prescribe. And as we know, there have been all sorts of huge scandals. Almost every single uh, American pharmaceutical company has been sued by the U.S. Justice Department for illegal uh, practices when it comes to marketing their drugs, and particularly around influencing doctors to push them to, uh, with cash gifts, with incentives, with other kinds of perks, to prescribe uh, some drugs over others. You know, this is exactly where we need a neutral a body that we can trust because you know leave this kind of stuff to leave this kind of stuff to the market and people are not going to be protected so again it comes back to the sort of fundamental role of government we together deciding that we want to protect ourselves against these possible dangers so i want to i want to just let you guys know we're, we're going to start moving into the audience portion soon so if you want to ask questions again as jennifer said you can start lining up at either of these two microphones here. Remember that if you ask a question, you are assenting to uh, being recorded. Um, I want, I'll, give you, yeah, I'll give you a last word, and then I'd like to, uh, to get to the audience. One of the greatest injustices that anybody, this is true of Republicans and Democrats, because they all do this, one of the greatest injustices we commit in our society is demonized drug companies. <laughs> these are the companies that are making, that are making the drugs and making the medical instrumentation that makes it possible for Americans to live to be in the 80s and 90s, and not just Americans. Most drug discovery, most medical innovation happens in this country. 75% of all medical innovation in the world happens in the United States because we're still the freest, although that's disappearing very quickly. These are the companies that have allowed us to live to be 85, and in many cases today, growing number of cases, 95 and over 100. These are the doctors and drug companies that make it possible for us not only to live that long, but to live healthy lives into those ages. Uh, the idea that they are somehow poisoning us and killing us when all evidence suggests quite to the contrary. We're living longer, better lives than ever before. These are some of the most heroic, virtuous companies in human history, and they should be celebrated. Let me talk one more question. If you gave me two institutions, one institution tells me that they're providing me, me information based on the profit motive, because they make money doing it. And another institution that provides me information, actually doesn't just provide information, but of course forces me through their actions one way or the other, in order to preserve the common good or the public interest, I take a profit motive any day. Any day. David, I'll, give you, I'll give you a last word on that. Well, on that point, I do hope we get to the topic of predatory lending at some point. Please. One last point about the, the, the pharmaceutical industry. I, you know, I agree with you, Ron, that these pharmaceutical companies have done some amazing things. And just as a general point, I think capitalism does some fantastic things. I mean, this is a phenomenal system, capitalism, the market, for for creating wealth, for creating inventions, for giving us things like, you know, the iPad or or Viagra. Uh, uh, he's from Pfizer. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, like we all uh, we all benefit from the market and from capitalism, but it is also a dangerous uh, system, and it, and it has, it, you know, it has some negative downsides that we also have to manage as a society, and I think. What we want is to kind of get the balance right. You know, we don't want so much.
regulation to kill the goose that lays the golden egg, but we don't want so much, so much of a Wild West situation that there's a lot of kind of casualties because there's not enough protection from, from people engaged in, in uh, uh, unscrupulous pursuit of profit. Okay, so audience questions. I'm gonna start over here. I'll alternate back and forth between the microphones. And again, please uh, try to be considerate for those standing behind you. I disagree with both of you that social security can be saved. Let that go. Uh, speaking of Governor Perry, Texas, uh, three counties in Texas, Galveston and two others, opted out of social security more than 30 years ago. <clears throat> People are, their workers are retiring at more than twice the rate that they would get from Social Security. The death benefit is, runs up to more than 800 times that of the $255 that Social Security pays. You couldn't buy a coffin for that. So my question is as to Mr. Callahan, by what logic do you defend the use of force to prevent workers from participating in private systems? What's the morality behind that? And Mr. Brooke, I believe your PhD is in finance. I suppose you would have something to say on the economics of this, if you would. Well, just to clarify, the, the workers who uh, are allowed to opt out of Social Security are public workers. Public workers. In, public, in, in municipal governments, and uh, public workers are allowed to opt out of Social Security in some cases. And yes, those public workers, public sector workers, often do get better returns than they would from Social Security because their pensions can be invested anywhere. And their pensions are invested often in, in uh, hedge funds or you know, highly profitable investment, investment vehicles. So they, they, they get a better return as a re as a result, Social Security has only been invested in U.S. Treasury securities because there are people who said, oh, we can't invest Social Security in the stock market because that's too much big government. So one reason Social Security hasn't been, been invested more, more in a more balanced portfolio is precisely because of those concerns. In terms of the question about force, I mean, this is the nature of uh, insurance. If an insurance system is to work, Everybody has to participate in that insurance system because if only the people who think that they're going to need the insurance participate, then you have uh, th then you have an insurance system which ends up not working. Like this is why this is the reason for the mandatory uh, health care, the individual health care mandate that everybody needs to have health insurance in this society. If the pools are going to uh, have enough healthy young people, the people who often opt out. Similarly, with uh, with auto insurance, you know that that. Everybody needs to have auto insurance, not just the people we know to be the bad drivers. Well, that, that's just not true. Uh, so insurance functions fine uh, with only some people participating, as long as it's a diversified pool. You, you certainly don't need everybody to participate in insurance, but insurance pool to function. And there are lots of examples of that, you know, from home insurance to auto insurance in states that, that uh, don't require everybody to participate, to the fact that there are many auto insurance companies, and those insurance pools within those companies still function, uh, even if everybody else is uh, with other companies. So there's absolutely no reason everybody has to participate in insurance policy. But Social Security is not an insurance policy. Social Security, insurance is voluntary. That's the nature of insurance. You buy it, you cannot buy it, you can renew it. That's the nature of insurance policy. Social Security is a system that forces us to participate in it. Uh, and the returns, the, the returns financially, of course the returns are going to be lower. Um, you're right. Uh, I don't think any of us, at least I don't want uh, the government investing Social Security in the stock market and hedge funds. They would be the dominant player, and it would basically be a form of socializing American industry and, and making the government the largest player in, in corporate America. So I'd like to, I'd like the Social Security to avoid, uh, avoid that as much as possible. But yeah, I mean, private insurance schemes for retirement would return far greater, far more money to retirees, uh, annuities would return far greater returns to retirees than does Social Security. For those who participate, those who don't won't get anything. And that's the problem for David, right? He's not willing to let those people who are irresponsible and won't buy those policies, he's not willing to let them suffer the consequences of their bad decisions. And he wants those people who are responsible to subsidize them. I say no. 
I say we shouldn't use quotes that are responsible. I know the subsidized data is fine. Next question. Uh, hi, my question is for David. Um, you've mentioned several times tonight that you don't believe the government is doing enough in a number of areas. So my question to you is, do you ever envision we will reach a point where, in your professional opinion, the government is doing enough to help all of these um, endangered constituencies? And if so, could you please describe what your vision of that society might look like? Well, let me, and let me just say, that's a great question. But I also like maybe Yara to talk about maybe an area where you don't think we do enough. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I see uh, the kind of society I would like to live in is a society where uh, government played a more active role in, in ensuring health care for all and we're moving in that, we're moving in that direction. Uh, if we live in a society where everybody had health security, that anybody uh, knew that if they got sick, there would be, there would be uh, treatment for them and they could they could uh, have care, and they weren't going to go bankrupt as a result. Uh, they weren't going to lose their home. I mean, a huge number of, of personal bankruptcies, something like 30% or, or more, are caused by medical debt. People who get sick, even people with insurance who get sick, and end up losing all of their wealth. And I think that that is not uh, the kind of civilized society that I want to live in. I, I, it, it kills me when I am, you know, a... a, a buy a newspaper from some guy on the street who's selling a paper, and I think, you know, that guy probably doesn't have health insurance. If that guy gets sick, he's going to be wiped out. I, I don't want to live in that kind of society. Uh, I would also like to live in a society where government played a, a, a much more active role in dealing with the, the biggest threat of our, of our time, which is climate change. And the fact that, the fact that we are... I disagree. Yeah, well, I... I <laughs> I'm not surprised. Uh, <laughs> you know that 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 uh, we're uh, uh, basically uh, creating a, a a future in which our grandchildren are going to face some very serious uh, climatic climactic disasters. That seems to me an easy problem to solve. That government should can play an interventionary role there in a very simple way, which is raise the price of carbon. Uh, and let the market do the rest. Simple, simple kind of intervention. Anyway, I could go on, but uh, I, I see that there's a lot of things that we're still not doing. Ultimately, I'm not imagining that I want to live in a in uh, a Sweden or something. This is, I think, the United States is a is a society which which wants a kind of more robust mar uh, balance between a market and the government. I think we can get that balance right. But after 30 years of, of deregulation and beating up on government, uh, I think that we're, we're still a ways, even with two years of Obama, we're still a ways from getting that balance right. So, Yaron, how about an area where maybe we don't do enough in government? Yeah, I want to. Sure. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, we don't do enough to catch cooks because we're too busy with the nonsense that is the regulatory uh, environment that, it is th that we've created. And I think the classical example of this, my favorite example is Bernie Madoff. Here's a crook. Here's somebody clearly stealing that we both agree should go to jail, right? To me, this is the only legitimate function of the SEC is to catch Bernie Madoff. This is their job. Go find people who are stealing billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars from hardworking people, you know, from, from, from uh, you know, whoever it is. And, they, and he wasn't the only one. There was a bunch of these Ponzi schemes going on in the country during the 2000s. And it took years and years to catch them. And when, and, but Buddy Madoff is unique in this sense that the SEC got memos from a hedge fund manager two years in a row, six, seven years before they caught him, telling them exactly what he was doing, and they ignored it. Now, why did they? It's not because they love Bernie Madoff, although Bernie Madoff was a very prominent guy, so there was a certain political cachet that he had, which I think explains the SEC's political, so they wanted to avoid it. But I think there's more to it than that. The reason they didn't do it is because they didn't have time. They were too busy watching me. Because, you know, I, when I buy stock, I have to report what I do to the SEC. I have to fill out, you know, uh, uh, 10 Gs and 10 Ds, and if I buy, God forbid, 5% of a company, the regulators come down and why are you doing that? You have to fill out a form. And if I buy 10%, I have to in writing explain my purpose. 
And they have to read this stuff, and they have to determine, is Iran a good guy, isn't he? They're so busy monitoring economic activity, legitimate legal economic activity, that they don't have time to catch the crooks. So that's where I think what we need is, is you don't need to add it to their budget. You need to reduce their budget. But if you could eliminate all the junk that they do, which is 99% of what the SEC does, and just focus on the criminals that actually catch a Bernie Madoff. <laughs> hey, wait a minute. I want to have a comment on health care. <laughs> uh, how about we go to the next question and we we'll keep going I, I, on. I'm going to see but let's, <laughs> let's keep going. I'm sure we can always come back. Health care, global warming. There are a lot of topics on the table still. <clears throat> Sir. Back to Social Security. <laughs> 2002 trustees paid economists 75 year projections on Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. They wouldn't put it in the documents. Hear no evil, see no evil. It was 45 trillion. Get rid of the total military budget. 45 trillion is a big number. BU economists, I'm waiting to make an appointment to we'll discuss a solution with it. Kotlikoff wrote a book. In 04, it had gone to 66 trillion. Hear no evil, see no evil. Are you aware of the generational accounting issue? And what are your suggestions? Well, let me just deal with the numbers, because I think the numbers are interesting, and hopefully we can do numbers. Uh, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, those three programs are in, you know, in, in accounting terms, in unfunded liabilities of about $100 trillion. You know, depending on how you do the numbers, it's 104, 90 something, but it's something in that range. Almost most of them, an overwhelming number of that is Medicare, Medicaid. You know, the dominant proportion of it is that. Um, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and interest payments on the debt consumed every dollar of revenue in 2015 under very generous assumptions in terms of economic growth between now and then. Uh, these issues are big issues. This is, this is not, a, these are not small numbers. These are big numbers. And let me just make a recommendation. We each in the numbers. Um, there's a study out there called USA Inc. by a woman named Mary Mika. Uh, who works with Kleiner Perkins in Silicon Valley. And she's got a 300 PowerPoint present, page PowerPoint presentation, and just the numbers. And it's a, it's a, it's a document that uh, left and right have signed off on uh, Al Gore and, uh, and some Republicans. And so she's just an analyst. She's just a financial analyst. And the numbers are quite stunning and, and really interesting because she puts it in graphs and she shows you exactly what's going on. So those are kind of, that's the, just from a physical perspective, that's kind of the, the challenge that we face as an economy moving forward. David? Uh, sure. Sure. I, I, do think, I do think we've talked a lot about social security. Thank you for the question, but we'll move on to another topic. Thank you. I have a larger sort of philosophical question. We've heard that the reason we as individuals sometimes can't make our own decisions is because we live in a society and we're subject to a social, social contract because we do. And uh, Dr. Brook very briefly said, almost under his breath before he moved on to another topic, that there is no social contract. So Dr. Brook, would you elaborate on that statement? Yes, I don't believe there is such a thing as a social contract. The contract is something that we consciously, purposefully, voluntarily enter into. When you have a contract, you do something consciously to exercise that contract. You're born. You didn't choose to be born. You didn't choose to be born where you were born. So I don't believe there is such a thing as a social contract. I think there's one, uh, I think you have to look at it differently. And this is the way I look at our lives in a society. I believe that human life depends on one ability that we have, one characteristic of human nature, and that is our ability to reason, our ability to think, our ability to project into the future, our ability to plan, our ability to reason. Reason is the best word. I believe that they, so the society should be organized in a way as to leave us as individuals to be free to reason, to reason our way to our own happiness, our own success, to you know, to our own values. Now, what is the enemy of reason? In my view, the enemy of reason, the thing that destroys reason, makes it impossible to think, makes it impossible to create, makes it impossible to grow as an individual, is force. When there's a gun put at your head, you don't have a choice. You do what the guy tells you with the gun in the head. Reason is out the window. 
So the, the pseudo-social contract, the only agreement we need to have in a society, and this is why we have government, this is why we have government is important, is that the gun goes away. If, if you think about human history, force has dominated human history. Human history is full of people forcing other people to do what some people wanted other people. Sometimes it was the majority, sometimes it was minority, but it was always through force. The great revolution that was the Enlightenment and the Age of Reason and the founding of this country was a rejection of that idea. And the idea that we as individuals have a right to our own life, and as a consequence, nobody, not a majority and not an individual, has a right to force us to do something we don't want to do. You know, unless we're infringing on somebody else's right. So, I want to extract that force. The government should be there to do that, to protect us from criminals, to protect us from Bernie Madoff, to protect us from people pulling guns on us. That's it. And other than that, we should be left free to make our own decisions, pursue our own rational values in the way that we believe best serves our own interests. David? Well, I mean, the great um, uh, advent of the Enlightenment was that the king would not have arbitrary power over us. We would have power over ourselves. And uh, we could use that power to create the kind of society we wanted. And, um, you know, uh, many people want protection from things beyond just a guy uh, who might rob us or hurt us. We also want protection against the company that might uh, pour DDT into the river upstream or into, might poison our well water, uh, as has happened in numerous places. Corporations poisoning, poisoning the groundwater, resulting in cancer. We want protection from that. If your kid dies from cancer because some corporation was trying to cut its costs, by putting toxic chemicals into the environment, that's just as, the kid is just as dead than if they were uh, mugged up and, and robbed and murdered on the street. And, 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 we, don't, and, we don't disagree about that, by the way. Poisoning somebody is a use of force right. against them, and that's a war for government. Right, and so one of the, and, and one of the, one of the uh, uh, extensions, the other thing that we have decided to do collectively as a society is protect ourselves from massive economic misfortune, from destitution, from, uh, you know, uh, remember the, the, the New Deal, the modern social safety net came out of the, the crash, the Great Crash and the, and the Great Depression, this sort of huge uh, uh, economic disaster that threw huge, large numbers of people out of work. Um, and it's perfectly reasonable for a democratic society to come together to choose to create forms of insurance that will protect us against that kind of misfortune. Because, you know, if you're wiped out financially because uh, of, of, you know, Wall Street has been turned into a casino and people are taking crazy risks with, with derivatives and, and what have you, well, that's just as bad as having your house robbed. That's worse than having your house robbed. That is a, that is a form of, not theft, but that's a form of, 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 uh, of, of uh, real, real harm, and uh, and so nobody is forcing anybody to do anything. We live in a democratic society. We have made these choices collectively. The mi minority does not always, uh, you know, individuals don't always get their way. There are certain things I would like to see government do that it's not doing. There are certain things the government does that Iran doesn't want it to do. Nobody always gets their way, but I think that it is completely misleading to keep using this metaphor of gun at your head. That, you know, Social Security, payroll tax, this is somebody putting a gun at your head, this is force, this is some kind of alien entity, it's coming and taking your money. No, this is a democratic society making shared choices about how to create well-being for all of us. Nobody always gets their way in a democratic society. I, I do want to move on to the next question. That was a very good question. I thought we had a good summary of the there. But I do want to move on because there are pe more people and we're running close to the end of time. Thank you for that question. Hello. Um, I have a question because about the FDA because that's kind of where I came in. Um, a statement was made by Yaron that said, you said that um, an individual would be willing to choose a drug because the pain, you know, nothing can be worse than that. So I would like you to elaborate on how somebody who's in that much pain and in, at that much mental stress would be capable of making a decision such as that. And the reason I'm asking is because there was a drug 
um, Accutane, which was like a skin clearing drug. And, you know, when you're a teen, you have acne, you're like, I will do anything. Well, the thing is, is that Accutane turned out to be very dangerous. You, you know, severe depression and suicidal thoughts, et cetera, et cetera. But when you're a teenager, first of all, when you're young, you're like, that'll never happen to me. You know, like, yeah, okay, maybe that guy over there, but not me. And so they were in that position to really, con you know, take control of the risk. So how is somebody who's in severe pain able to evaluate and make it a, lo you know, a logical decision, as you said, they should be able to? So what you're asking is if you as an individual are not in a position to make a rational decision, who should make it for you? Right. And I would argue that the people who should make it for you is whoever you designate. And I, I know I have a living will where if something happens to me and I can make those decisions, my wife makes those decisions. If you're a teenager, your parents should make those decisions. If you're an adult and you have good friends and you, you don't think you're in a position, but the people who shouldn't be making those decisions are a group of scientists and bureaucrats detached from you who don't know you, who don't know your risk preferences, you haven't talked to your doctor. You know, we talk about personalized medicine. Everybody wants to talk about personalized medicine. Personalized medicine would be great, but we're never going to get personalized medicine with FDA. Because personalized medicine is about you, your particular biological needs. Discussing with a person who knows this, your doctor, knows all your conditions, and making decisions about the kind of treatments you as an individual needs. No group out in Washington can make that decision for you. Now may I ask a follow-up? Well, it's very interesting to say, but would your wife really have an objective opinion if she sees you in pain every single day? But, but that's my problem, it's not yours. My point is this. My point is this. The majority doesn't have a right over my life. 51% of the people don't have a right to decide what I should, what drug I should take and what should not take. It's wrong of them. They are, and excuse my metaphor, they are pulling a gun to my head. Because, <laughs> you know, people, this is a coup to people where they want to take a particular drug. They've got a deal. They've got the money to buy it. They go to the pharmaceutical companies and they are physically restrained from taking that drug because the majority, 51, 61, 99%, I don't care, it doesn't matter, won't, don't think that that's good for them. Maybe, you know, I have a friend who, uh, who, who, who is getting older and he's worried about kind of those kind of late of life decisions and he's written a, a, a will that doesn't give it to his wife because he's worried about exactly your argument. So he's given it to somebody else who he trusts to make an objective decision. But it's his life. He makes that decision. You don't make the decision for him. You guys don't make that decision. Majorities are not don't own your life. This is this is why when we talked about the enlightenment, my last sentence. Thank you. I said that it was about you owning your life. He, David said, we own our lives. So the king doesn't do it, we decide. No. The king doesn't do it. This is the, the revolution that is America. You decide as an individual. Not to have another back and forth on the FDA, but I want to pull out a kind of broader point here, which is like individuals having enough information to make the right choice. And one of the reasons we have government regulation, whether it's over uh, drugs or whether it's over consumer products like cars, is because of uh, overwhelming uh, experience and evidence that it's hard for individuals to have enough information to make the right choice. You know, uh, the, the, the world that Iran imagines would work effectively uh, is one where everybody has perfect information to, to be able to make to be able to, to be able to make these kinds of choices. And I think that it's very hard to have that kind of perfect information. It, it, if a drug is brought to market without going through proper trials and the pharmaceutical companies are pumping it with billions of dollars in advertising and their paid off doctors are pushing it too and uh, you know you're feeling some duress, uh, well you could, you could make a decision that ends your life based upon wrong information. And this is where actually you do want those scientists who are objective, who are detached, who aren't in the pay of the pharmaceutical industry, who aren't a relative uh, you know, that just wants to, to hear you stop uh, complaining about your knee or something. Uh, 
this is where we want that objective knowledge. And we as a society have, over time, given the FDA more power to make those decisions. And these regulations to protect food and drugs and consumer products from killing us, these are very popular. Thank you very much for that question. So, um, so my question is about the EPA. There's uh, been some growing sentiment against the EPA, particularly by certain politicians who support smaller government roles. Um, take, for example, uh, Mr. Perry, who has said that uh, you know he would do all he can to limit the role of the EPA, which is a job-killing um, organization. Um, and yet, at the same time, there's a massive disconnect. This is a man who receives massive financial support from uh, the oil companies through lobbyists and through campaigning um, uh, donations. And uh, his state has been, you know, has had record-breaking consecutive days over 100 degrees, um, is on fire. There's, you know, significant scientific evidence that suggests there is climate change happening. So my question is, without um, a neutral body like the EPA, how can someone like me stand up against the massive inertia of the oil companies whose profit lies in, you know, continuing to destroy our environment? Um, for example, fracking, you know, which is, has been shown to be just basically pumping toxins into our groundwater. How can I, you know, when we rule that corporate money is speech, how can I stand up against something as massive as an oil company without the EPA backing me? I think that's one for your own. <laughs> so first, I, I'm not going to thank Governor Perry uh, one way or the other. Um, but that's the second thing. biggest injustice that we commit as a society after you know uh, going after drug companies is that we go after oil companies. Uh, and maybe oil companies should be number one. Uh, oil companies have benefited humanity you know, as much, if not more, than drug companies. Uh, you couldn't imagine your life. It's unimaginable to you. Life without oil companies. The products, the benefits that we get from the plastics and the, and the transportation and everything that is oil, a lot of this room is built from oil, um, is just unimaginable. So let me just say, I'm a huge fan of oil companies. I think oil companies are the, one of the greatest beneficiaries to, human man, to mankind in human history. Now, what do we do about uh, environment, so-called environmental problems? And, and you know, if I have time, I'll say what I think about global warming. Um, <laughs> Let's keep this one quick. Quick? Well, we have a few more people that want to ask questions. I suspect, uh, based on based on my reading and my understanding of the environmental threats, so-called threats that we face, is that most of them don't exist. And that the few that do exist, the few that are true poison, um, that David mentions, and, and I'm sure there are others, uh, that's what government should be about. That is, government is there to protect us from violating our lives, our property rights, when people are trying to hurt us. When some chemical is out in the end clearly harming human beings, then, you know, that's the role of government to, to deal with that. But that is a tiny fraction, a tiniest fraction of what the EPA actually does. Most of what the EPA, and it, it's astounding to me that somehow the EPA and the FDA and all these are somehow objective entities there is influence and more influence by political agendas of various parties than, than profit-seeking organizations that are primarily influenced by money and long-term money, uh, long-term profit, which is a, a much healthier thing. But can I give a, a, a global warming view? Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, can you do it in 60 seconds? Okay. So I give David a chance. I'm that. willing to grant global warming, so let's start with that. Let's grant the fact that the Earth is warming. I leave a willing to grant, and I don't really believe this, I'm willing to say that it's even going to be somewhat catastrophic. I don't. I, I think it's ridiculous, and, and the scientists have showed it that it's going to be horrifically catastrophic. But let's even assume that it's going to be mildly catastrophic. That it's bad, right? The solution is freedom, capitalism, and technology. Let's get really, really rich so that our grandchildren are so rich they can deal with it uh, in their own way. <laughs> <laughs> David, I, I think you disagree. Yeah, I'm going to give him a few minutes because he, he still needs to yeah, just, just, just on the, the EPA. In my mind, the EPA is another fantastic example of the success of government. And if you want, if you want to be reminded of that, visit China and go to one of those Chinese cities which are choking in air pollution 
where thousands of people are dying every year uh, be because of the, the dirty air in those in those cities. And uh, this is an, this is what American cities used to be like. Not maybe not quite that bad, but terrible enough that that huge numbers of people were dying from air pollution. We used to have rivers that caught on fire. Okay, we used to have water that killed people because of the contaminants in it. The Environmental Protection Agency, which we empower democratically to protect us, has been a huge success in cleaning the air, in cleaning the water, in creating a higher quality of life. And in my mind, you know, Iran keeps saying, this has been a disaster, this has been a catastrophe. Actually, I think American society has been doing pretty well over the past, you know, 50 years. We've become you know, since the end of World War II, one of the richest societies in history. We have increased life expectancy from, from 50 to, to 78 since, since 1945. I mean, we have uh, increased the, 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 the kind of amenities that we all enjoy, uh, you know, in terms of cars and homes, you know, the amount of education we get. We have become a phenomenally rich society at the same time that we have seen the rise big government that he keeps saying is so catastrophic. And I don't think that it's a coincidence that we have had the rise of, of this great prosperity and the rise of government over the last same 60 years. I think that government has helped create the conditions of that prosperity by helping create the modern middle class, by creating you know, water we can drink, air that we can breathe, cars that we can drive in with, without being killed. And you know, so, so it's like, I don't, I, don't, I don't see where the disaster is here. I think that this society is, is working pretty well, you know, with some ups and downs, and that we have got the balance pretty right. We have a lot of prosperity from the goose that lays the golden egg, from capitalism, from this dynamic system, and we have some government regulation to prevent bad things, to protect us against economic misfortune. We've, we have a balance here. We have a mixed economy. It's been working pretty well. Thank you for that question. Uh, this is a question with Dr. Brock. Uh, I think one of the biggest mistakes, although honest, that the founding fathers made was putting this bylaws into the Constitution, which was uh, provide for the general welfare. What do you think was the actual intentions of the uh, founders? Because you know, if they, for, like, if they foresaw what was going on today, they probably would not have put those words in there. So what was that intention provide for the general welfare? When they, what did you put? Well, I think they had a perception of the general welfare as the welfare of individuals. They were individualists. They believed in individual freedom and individual rights. And their view of the general welfare was, you know, that the government should not interfere in your ability to live your own life in, in the best way that you could live it. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think that money fathers would be horrified and would be would be devastated by what has happened to this country. And let me just comment on why I think things are so bad. Uh, first, um, the improvement in human life, the, the, the improvement in the quality of life and life expectancy and everything were far more dramatic from uh, 1800 to 1913 than they have been from 1913 to today. Uh, and again, if I had time, I'd give you lots of illustrations of that. But that's where the real action happened in terms of the improvement and creation of the middle class and, and everything else. Uh, it's gotten better since then, absolutely. This is why, you know, it, it, unfortunately it looks like it's going to take a major collapse of civilization for people to listen to opposition. Uh, because life is pretty good, why, why think? Um, but, I, but I think, let me say this, I, I think the real problem is what could have been. Uh, what we're missing is what freedom could have resulted in. And I'm not just talking about the materialistic side, we can talk about better cause and faster cause or whatever. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the sense of freedom that an individual can have in a free society. I'm talking about the spirit of a free people. I'm talking about the poor in this country who are being institutionalized into poverty, who today are burdened with an entitlement mentality that is killing them. Not killing them materially, because we keep them alive, we, we make sure to do it, but killing them spiritually. And Thomas Sowell, I think, has done a phenomenal job of documenting what has happened particularly to the bad community uh, since the introduction of welfare. The welfare, the social security, all these entitlements have destroyed the human spirit. 
And particularly, uh, you know, Ayn Rand said this, and, and I think she was absolutely right, the biggest victim of, a, of, of statism, of state intervention, of, of restriction on individual freedom, the biggest victim is the, are the ambitious poor, or the poor who would want to have a better life. They are institutionalized into poverty, they are told that's not their role in life, and they are held back, and as a consequence, the mobility of the, the, the poor's mobility, and you know, we should quote, the mobility, social mobility in this country has deteriorated dramatically since the 19th century. And less poor becoming rich and less rich becoming poor, that movement has shrunk dramatically because of the growth of government, because of the growth of old So this is this is much more of a spiritual, it's a materialistic issue as well, but, it, but it's hugely a spiritual issue as well. What it feels like to be a free person versus what it feels like to have a gun placed in your forehead for a lot of what you do in life. David? But before you answer, David, I just want to give you a, um, since I like you so much, and because it was raining earlier, we usually stop right on time, but, we, but we're provoking some mad thoughts here, so I think we should keep going for at least another 10 minutes. But if you go longer than 10 minutes, I'm going to put a gun to your head. <laughs> so, yeah, David, yeah, no, David's going to respond. We have three more people up at the microphones, and, and, and we can try to keep them quick. Well, in 1960, before the, the war on poverty, 22% of Americans are poor, were poor. Today, uh, we've had an uptick lately, but, but the poverty rate has generally been about 12 or 13%. So in fact, you know, Yaron just gave a, a speech about how government has created all this new poverty and oppressed the poor. Actually, government has, has cut the poverty rate virtually in half over the past 40 years. Another major achievement, particularly among the elderly. As for the founders, Iran says, you know, if they came back today, they would be horrified. Really? If they came back today, they'd be like, oh my god, it's still here. It's still working. There hasn't been, you know, with, with, with the exception of, of, of one civil war, there hasn't been all sorts of, you know, disruption and chaos. There hasn't been the kinds of, you know, death squads and killings and, and political collapses that we see elsewhere. We've had an incredibly stable democracy for almost 230 years, a massive success. We've had factions. Some of the founders were more on the right. Some of them believed more in big government, like Alexander Hamilton. But those factions have managed to work together. They've made compromises. They've come up with a, with a balance. They would be extremely pleased, those founders. Uh, this is a question primarily for Dr. Brooke, although I'd be interested in, in both of your opinions. Uh, Dr. Brooke, I'm wondering what you consider the prerequisites to be for an individual to have the capacity to make rational decisions for themselves. You've mentioned repeatedly that government force, or force in general, might be one of the things that removes that, the ability to make rational choice. I'm wondering what you think about things like coercion, and where coercion might exist from social forces. I and mean, I'm inspired by your mentioning of poverty, Things like racism or sexism, to what extent do those things remove the prerequisites that are necessary for rational choice to exist? And to what extent can your sort of model help deal with those issues? And is that also a role for government in addition to dealing with sort of more direct economic or physical force? Thank you for that question, Dr. Brook. Yeah, so I believe that every human being, you know, as long as you've got a well functioning brain, there's so many people who don't and, and, and do not have that capacity, but 99.99% of humanity has the capacity to be rational. Um, <laughs> capacity, <laughs> let's say they would. Uh, and I think it's capacity that matters, because I think everybody has the ability to engage it, and when they do engage it, they, reality rewards them, and that's great, and when they don't, reality penalizes them, and that's justice. Um, I don't believe that uh, if we live in a society in which Force is extracted, you know, force and force, real force and force is extracted by government. That these other factors are indeed coercion. I don't believe sexism is coercion. It might be an obstacle, it might be a challenge, but I don't think it's coercion. I don't think racism is coercion, unless it's done by government. And it's got a gun at the end of the, you know, <laughs> at the end of the coercion. Uh, racism is horrible. It's, it's evil. But people are racist. You know, they're irrational. They will suffer the consequence of that irrationality, in my view. Um, 
So I don't think it's the government's job to eradicate what it views as bad ideas. I think that's very dangerous. I mean, we all might agree that racism is a bad idea. I don't think there's anybody in the room that doesn't agree with that. But there, but there are a lot of people in this room, and I'm sure a lot of people out there in the street, who think my ideas are pretty dangerous. And maybe even coercive, because there might be some young people here hearing them. and might. I don't view that as coercive. You know, anybody has the ability to say you're wrong is wrong. I don't agree with it. Everybody has an ability to say David is wrong. Everybody has the ability to say those people over there who won't allow Jews into their store, they're wrong. And we're going to boycott that store and, no, and not go into that store. Any of us are not going to go into that store. Uh, so I don't think that these factors, I don't think corporations, when they hire and fire people, that is forced. Those are voluntary contracts that you go into and you go out of. So none of that, in my view, is coercion. And when we try to control them, that's when you get forced. That's when you get real coercion. And that's when you get the destruction of liberty and the destruction of freedom and the destruction of our ability to make rational choices. There's certain things, for example, yeah. I am not able once I, I am not able to make a rational choice about my retirement. I can't decide because, you know, 15% of my income is taken from me by force. I'd rather use that 15% for something else. Two more questions, and let's try to keep them brief. Dr. Callahan, if you were in charge of minimum wage law, what would you set it at? I personally think it should be fifty or five hundred dollars. I mean, the government is there to help me. You would want you want the minimum wage to be fifteen? No, no. What, what do you think it should no. be? Because uh, you are from the government to help me. Yes. <laughs> I personally think you should make it five hundred dollars. Yeah. Um, it's <laughs> a minimum wage question. Uh, minimum, the, the minimum wage question. Um, actually, the minimum wage question is a, is a good opportunity to pick up where you're on left off on the topic of coercion. You know, this notion that the that the that the only entity that engages in coercion in American society is government, I think, is fundamentally wrong. In fact, one of the reasons why we as a society empower government to do uh, the various things that it does is because the market has very dangerous and coercive powers that we as individuals often don't have the ability to resist. It has coercive powers in the economic realm. In large, I mean, this was one of the, the critiques of 100 years ago, when large trusts and the robber barons controlled American society, basically, through controlling uh, the economy through these interlocking trusts and could, and could crush small business owners like that. Uh, we came up with antitrust laws in a way to, 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 to ensure more proper competition. Uh, uh, corporations and private sector has coercive powers when it comes to the labor market. If there's 9% unemployment as there is today, actually you don't really have a lot of choice in terms of the jobs you take. Especially if you don't have a college degree, you may not have many choices at all. You take the job that you get. And if there weren't a minimum wage law, uh, what would corporations be paying today? What would Walmart be paying today in the absence of a minimum wage law? 9% unemployment, $3 an hour, $4 an hour? Who knows? They'd pay, pay whatever, whatever they want. We created the minimum wage law. We created the 40-hour work week. We created other basic labor protections because workers didn't have the power, even with unions themselves, to resist the coercive power of business and to basically be, be it was you know, a modern form of slavery. If you have no other options, if you have to take whatever job you can, that's not that much different really than slavery. And that is where government came along to say that you know, employers actually have to pay a basic minimum wage. They have to pay overtime if you work more than 40 hours a week. They, you know, you know the, these labor laws gave us the modern weekend, which didn't previously exist. I would put the minimum wage, if the minimum wage were, had kept up with inflation where it had, uh, from starting in 1968, we'd have a minimum wage of about $10 an hour, which would still not be enough for many workers. About 30% of people who work full-time are not making enough money to afford basic expenses. 
uh, but it would be something. So yes, raise the minimum wage. So 10, so 10 uh, bucks an hour unemployment would be well over 10%, I can guarantee that. And one of the reasons it's 9% today is because of unemployment, because of minimum wage, because you can't employ people who produce less than whatever the minimum wage happens to be. But their unemployment rate was 4.6% in 2007. The minimum wage hasn't changed much. This is economics 101, when you drive the price of something up, the demand gonna... for it goes down. This is not this is not science fiction. This is simple. One plus one equals two. <laughs> We're gonna go to our final audience question. And before we do, I, I just want to say thank you to all. It's very uh, engaging conversation. The questions were, were fantastic. I can't believe an hour and a half has gone by already. So give yourselves a round of applause. Thank you. I think it was David that mentioned uh, at one point saying, well, we don't expect to have a uh, culture like that of Sweden, which sparked something in my memory, which is that um, I was shocked when I was studying 19th century history to find out that uh, in the middle of the 19th century, Sweden had a couple of horrifying um, um, famines. And so that people were leaving Sweden as much as they could. And I realized that's when my great-grandparents came to the United States, because they would have starved if they tried to stay in Sweden. And so this, to me, this shows that cultures can uh, improve and can enact uh, ch social changes that dramatically improve the quality of life over the long term, and uh, as much as we may not want a nanny state like that in Sweden that we, have, we can see that they've been able to improve their quality of life dramatically since the time when everybody was starving. Do you, either, you want to respond? I'll just note that, I, that you know, the comparisons of the U.S. to Europe are, getting, are becoming uh, moots because uh, more and more the difference between the two are set, uh, uh, is, is narrowing. So the percent of GDP spent by government, which includes state, federal, and, and local government, between the U.S. and Europe is shrinking dramatically. So the differences are, are pretty small. It's, it's uh, you know, we're not hugely capitalistic and they're not hugely socialistic. We're variations on the mixed economy. Um, and uh, you know, I, I would still, I, you know, I've mentioned this before in a, in a previous debate or something, I can't remember. But I would offer this uh, wager. Um, of course, we'll never find out that, that what happens, but I would offer to lower all uh, immigration restrictions between the U.S. and Sweden and see which way the population flows. David, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to give you the last word here. A mixed economy works. It works. America has been working over the past 60 years since the advent of an of a, of a activist and expanded government. We've created, through a lot of these policies, the modern middle class that, that we take for granted today. Unfortunately, a middle class which is under siege. Access to, expanded access to higher education and infrastructure that allows the, the, the creation of prosperity, investments, government investments in basic scientific research. We've seen uh, the, the rise of the social safety net, the social insurance system, so that nobody ever falls uh, too, too far, and we've seen interventions in the labor market to ensure that, that workers get, get you know, a fair wage. And unfortunately, over the past 30 years, this mixed economy, which has been working so well, has come under attack through the kind of kind of principled ideological uh, uh, ideas that, that Iran has been putting out. And I say principled because I think that he, he, you know, he does believe this, obviously. There's a lot of uh, uh, authenticity there. But, but fundamentally, it is attacking a system that has been working based upon an ideological animus that um, I think the vast majority of, of, uh, you know, uh, of Americans don't actually want to get rid of Social Security, don't want to get rid of the minimum wage, don't want to get rid of the FDA, don't want to get rid of the EPA, don't want to get rid of OSHA that protects workers from, from, from dangerous work environments. Don't want to get rid of a lot of the, the things. Don't want to get rid of Pell Grants that help young kids, uh, poor kids go to college. Don't want to get rid of our public university system. Don't want to starve infrastructure. Don't want to do any of these things. But that is exactly where this critique 
leads, which is attacking the public structures that make our prosperity and well-being uh, possible. And we need to, 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 to really stand up against this. So thank you for... Uh, so, It's a great way to end, and I just got to say, wow, man, I think you covered a lot of great topics. I really, really want to thank our, our, our panelists up here. It was a great dialogue, um, definitely a difference in philosophy, but I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you, guys. <laughs>